This is Duke University. This collaborative presentation will be an excursion through the world of the physically dead and the socially dead, discussing black survival, resistance, and regenerative violences in the popular television series, The Walking Dead. We use the unrivaled character of Michonne and her resistance through unprecedented survival as the focus of this exploration. What we find most significant is her indisputable rank as the character who can most easily navigate the borders of life and death. She fares extremely well in the apocalypse, and by prospering in this world, Michonne resists expectations of the spectral black body and the subjugated female body. We read her survival as a means of resistance. This project is a joint intervention bringing together the vastly different but remarkably complementary works of myself and Dane, taken from the fourth chapter of my thesis, The Haunted Ground We Walk On, Unknowable Racialized and Gender Subjects, and a paper that Dane will be presenting at SUSE next month, Gendered and Racialized Violences in Spaces of Captivity, Exploring Alterity and Animality in the Prison and Animal Industrial Complexes. So we're both very deeply invested in examining how revenants of the past and institutional violences manifest in The Walking Dead, how Michonne's embodiment is a gendered and racialized subject, and also as a racial and animal other function as forms of resistance, and how the zombie apocalypse presents opportunities for new resistances through the regeneration of violences. We read The Walking Dead as its own universe, as well as a cultural text and a mode of knowledge production, in order to investigate Michonne as an extraordinary figure within it. And this work has been very challenging, but also very rewarding for us. And today's presentation is really just the tip of an iceberg. So death is contagious within the zombie narrative. The regenerative institutional violences of the prison and animal industrial complexes become even more apparent in the apocalypse. There are direct connections between these spaces of captivity, and we find it imperative to include them in this discussion of black survival and as resistance in The Walking Dead, as both complexes have a direct relationship and significance to the devaluing of black life and perpetual state violence against devalued, socially dead, human and non-human bodies. As such, our discussion will focus on the ways in which Michonne and other persons of color in the principal group resist in the zombie apocalypse, especially in the spaces of the prison and the slaughterhouse. Above all, we argue that institutional violences, like the undead, regenerate in the apocalypse. We are concerned with the physical movement of Michonne and with as the undead, all three forms, uh, in The Walking Dead's narrative, and we are also concerned with the revolutionary Black Lives Matter movement, and we read these movements as dissimilar forms of resistance, both of which provoke fear by trespassing on white spaces and white privilege. For fans of The Walking Dead, the name Michonne conjures up the image of her standing tall with her katana blade in her hand. And this blade is a symbol of her warrior status and of her tacit resistance. Michonne is often seen moving among the dead with an effortless stride. She has bound two zombies in chains chopped off their arms, ripped out their lower jaws, and drags them along with her as a form of protection. This is a testament to how adept Michonne is at navigating in this space. However, what is far more impressive to us is the fact that she is sometimes able to walk with zombies even without her pets. It seems as if she's already one of them, already dead, and zombies only have a taste for living flesh. We argue that because of Michonne's abject experiences with extraordinary violences as a black female subject in the pre-apocalyptic world, she is able to thrive among the dead in this world. Black survival is always resistance, but Michonne's is extraordinary in the world of the walking dead. Always in constant motion, we read her refusal to be still and refusal to be vulnerable, especially in the captive space of the prison as a resistance which is twofold against the policing of black emotionality and the arrest of black bodies. So essentially we're exploring the connections between persons who we understand to be similarly constructed and conceived of through their relationship to certain ideological and institutional violences. And these violences simultaneously rely upon and reinforce the ideas which create and perpetuate the condition of social death for all devalued persons, human and non-human.
And we want to clearly acknowledge that direct comparisons of human and non-human animal violences often reify the animality of oppressed human populations. So we approach this project as one that has to lack complete coherency um, as a just jointed argument. And although these, these oppressions cannot be neatly compared, they are mutually constitutive as they operate via the same logic of domination. And we also acknowledge that it would be equally as problematic to equate the state of existing materially in a black body with the state of existing as an undead zombie subject. This work draws connections with zombification and blackness through their constructed relationship to abjection and social death, but it does not conflate the two as indistinguishable <laughs> beings. We are attempting to highlight the ways in which zombies are constructed and understood through ideologies about the perceived animality of blackness, while also examining the significance of Michonne's character as a black female subject, resisting and surviving an unending onslaught of the undead. So in her essay on abjection, Julia Kristeva defines several variants of abjection, one of which describes it as that which does not respect borders, positions, or rules. So the presence of a zombie indicates that there has been a disruption of those natural margins, and it forces us to confront the fragility of our socially defined borders, especially those between life and death. Moreover, we read the zombie and its racial otherness as the ultimate objection. On more than one occasion in the 1800s, the name zombie, spelled with an I without the E, was attributed to slaves who instigated revolutions against their masters and led their people to freedom from lives of captivity and violence and oppression. And so the word zombie became associated with black slaves and those who aroused them to dismantle racist institutions in which whites profited from the suffering of black bodies. This uprising of restless and enraged black slaves incited fear in whites that the zombie was a force that would seize from them their power over the racial other. And this white fear of a vengeful blackness has persisted throughout history and is consistently apparent to us in the continued criminalization of black bodies and especially in reaction to the Black Lives Matter movement. Even as societal fears change, the anxieties about the disruption of whiteness persist in the zombie narrative. The ideal vision of middle-class American life, stability, unity and home ownership are continually decimated. A zombie horde is not made up of individual bodies with different motivations. It's a single body with a single mission, and that mission is to dismantle the established order. So for those who are invested in maintaining this established order, the zombie horde can easily be read as resembling civil rights protests and other political riots by black Americans. Consider the horde of people, mostly people of color, who are coming together now in the Black Lives Matter movement with a single driving mission, which is to dismantle the established order. Gatherings have sprouted up all across the US and around the globe. The world has rallied behind communities of color in America, standing in solidarity in Syria, in Israel, Iran, Spain, London, and in so many other countries, people are lining the streets and declaring with loud voices that Black Lives Matter. And since this emergence of protesters in Ferguson and beyond, some white conservatives have written really strong opinion pieces, slandering demonstrators and calling them variations of savage, animal, monster, and zombie. The Ferguson zombie apocalypse, as it has been named, is triggering for spectators and witnesses in different ways. So while some of us recall images from the civil rights movements of the 50s and 60s, others are reminded of a fictional zombie uprising. So put more simply, some see this revolution, a crescendo of black bodies as a beginning or a rebirth, while others see this as the literal end of the world, as an apocalypse of whiteness. Black movement and black movements are a threat to an invasion of white spaces. Early descriptions of the misappropriated zombie resemble racist ideas about the limited intellect of black people, about our animality, our lack of sentience, and our ability to perform mindless labor. Ideas which have undoubtedly perpetuated since chattel slavery. It is not surprising, nor is it coincidental that white conservatives have referred to Black Lives Matter demonstrators as animals and zombies. This reinforcement of animality is purposeful. 
In the face of Blacks declaring their humanity and the value of Black life, those who benefit from racist and speciesist social systems must redraw the lines to reconnect Blackness with animality. Black bodies never get to be human. Black bodies never get to be alive. So ontological dualism, such as human and animal, mean that the popular reading of the relationship between persons of color, non-human animals, and zombies is often simply the animalization of persons of color. Um, but we consider the way that blackness, and particularly black masculinity, is read. Um, black men are at once understood to be too savage, or too of body to be fully human, um, and yet too guilty and too purposefully violent to be fully animal. In other words, we argue that persons of color occupy a rift between human and animal that simultaneously denies these populations the status of personhood and the rights of humans, as well as the presumed natural innocence of non-human animals. And we believe that this is most legible in the racialized discourses surrounding the case of Michael Vick, and especially the case of Andre Robinson. Um, the zombie other appears to exist apart from this dichotomy due to its objection. Um, the zombie is not a natural being. Um, still, zombies are seen as of the body and are far removed from any previously held consciousness. Therefore, their existence is read as empty and savage. The animality and disposability of blackness is frequently used to justify violent, oppressive institutions. Certain bodies make populations, or certain laws make populations unqualified for full personhood by the very composition of their bodies. And these populations occupy spaces of living death. Essentially, to be socially dead is to be ineligible for personhood, and socially dead beings produce the limits of the social, valuable, and sentient body. Those who are socially dead are subject to be punished but not protected by the state and are rendered immobile in social, political, and economic systems. The very existence of those who do not fit the institutionally established construction of personhood is criminalized. And the devaluation and disposability of these beings is made possible largely through captive spaces. Captive spaces function as a means to construct our understandings of humanity, animality, alterity, and legitimate violences. And through them, the normative hu human subject is produced and reproduced. And oppressions and balances and against other persons, both human and non-human, are naturalized. So the normative human subject is established on the backs of human and non-human animal others via captive spaces. And the violent, oppressive ideologies and institutions that necessitate captive bodies rely on human and non-human animal others in tandem. The Walking Dead demonstrates the privileging of the normative human subject through the captive spaces of the prison and the slaughterhouse, as well as the bodies that enable their functioning. In the series, the principal group of survivors directly moves from the prison to the slaughterhouse, seeking refuge in each while suffering ordinary and extraordinary harms. Although the zombie apocalypse has seemingly destroyed the infrastructure of the state, its violent institutions have taken new forms. Now, zombies and systemic oppressions haunt the world as remnants of former trauma former traumas that, in their own way, are just as potent in their ability to destroy. The premiere of season three introduces the prison, where the vast majority of inmate walkers are black men. Despite the fact that The Walking Dead is set in and around Atlanta, Georgia, walkers of color are rarely seen. Therefore, the sudden appearance of so many black walkers really speaks to the pervasive racialized violence of the prison industrial complex and the curious apocalyptic normalization of that violence. It's significant that this space contains the most persons of color that we've seen at this point in the series, and also since <laughs> this point in the series. Um, in the wake of the zombie apocalypse, the prison offers, offers safety and freedom for the group, particularly its white members. Um, group member Carol says this is more space than we've had in a while, because um, the perimeter is fenced. Um, for white members of the group, the prison is a new chance at life. Um, however, persons of color in the principal group approach the prison with far more hesitancy. Michonne and T-Dog are clearly very tense um, from the moment they enter, uh, fully aware of the continued colonial project that this space represents. T-Dog remarks, I bet I'm the only black man who has ever broken into a prison. When wounded, Michonne's source of safety and care is the prison, yet she still resists staying in such a loaded space even though she can't survive outside of it. Um, after she is well, she's always the first to volunteer for supply runs, and she frequently leaves to search for their nemesis, the governor. Michonne never rests in the prison. She's always moving out of the space or working around the perimeter of the building for defense purposes. 
She is in constant motion, not only, isn't, not only in the prison, but throughout the entire series. As we previously argued, Michonne's perpetual movement can be read as a form of resistance to the racialized politics of self-awareness, rage, vulnerability, and containment. In the prison, this resistance is driven by the historical and ongoing elimination and erasure of black bodies. So soon after securing the prison against zombie inmates, our group almost immediately encounters a group of human inmates. Um, and of these five inmates, four are men of color. Um, almost immediately, three men, all men of color, die, echoing the disposability of the black zombie inmates. T-Dog tries to convince group leaders to let the remaining prisoners um, join their group, but ultimately fails. In this space, he shows the most compassion, understanding, and resistance to the racialized violence of the prison, as well as a resistance to Rick's authority. Rick, a white man and the default leader, is seen as a really crucially authoritative figure, in part because of his pre-apocalyptic law enforcement career. Um, so he makes the vast majority of the group's major decisions, and his take is pretty much considered the last word on any matter. Therefore, not only does Rick survive, but his authority as an officer and his legacy as an enforcer of the U.S. criminal justice system survives as well. In seasons four and five, after the group has been forced out of the prison, they encounter Terminus, the slaughterhouse originally disguised as a sanctuary. The slaughterhouse initially presents a facade of normality and safety and promises a return to the pre-apocalyptic world with Americana, flowers, barbecue, and a welcoming maternal figure named Mary. Terminus lures survivors to their deaths, echoing human and non-human animal violences from the pre-apocalyptic world. The slaughterers often repeat the motto, either you're the butcher or the cow. Violences against non-human animals are always gendered and racialized. Post-humanist, eco-feminist scholars have effectively argued that because non-male persons, non-human animals, persons of color, and other non-normative populations are seen as of the body, their oppressions continually invoke and perpetuate one another. In The Sexual Politics of Meat, Carol Adams famously expands upon this argument, stating that there is a pervasive attitude and action that animalizes women and sexualizes and feminizes animals. For this reason, factory farms and slaughterhouses are captive spaces inherently gendered and also racialized. Control of bodies via the slaughterhouse can be considered crucial for hegemonic masculinity, white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, and the continued but ultimately impossible colonial project. The slaughterhouse uses implemental tools such as shackles, stickers, rippers, and splitters that constantly conjure the captivity and violence historically suffered by humans. In the act of slaughter, historical traumas are indirectly summoned. Marginalized human populations greatly suffer in the captive space of the slaughterhouse um, because slaughterhouse work is one of, free, I mean, it's always named one of the most dangerous occupations, and it's frequently named a site for human rights abuses. Persons of color, undocumented immigrants, and ex-convicts disproportionately, disproportionately do the emotionally and physically taxing labor in this space. Therefore, the violences that occur in the slaughterhouse are twofold racialized. Ex-convicts may literally move from the prison to the animal industrial complex, never escaping captivity. This is a phenomenon echoed in The Walking Dead when the main group travels directly from the prison to the slaughterhouse. Conversely, humans may move from the animal to the prison industrial complex, um, as there is an empirical link between violent slaughterhouse work and increased crime rates, um, particularly those of sexual violence. Thus, a double pipeline between the prison and slaughterhouse exists, strengthening um, our reading that these complexes are mutually constitutive, racialized, and animalized captive spaces. At Terminus, our group is stripped of their weapons and packed into train cars. Michonne begins fashioning a makeshift katana, while other group members use seemingly innocuous materials to fight off those who seek to consume their flesh, both zombies and human. Ultimately, these weapons are futile because gas is thrown into the train car and our people are taken to a slaughterhouse killing floor. In a sterile room with butcher tables and blood draining sinks, eight men, three of color, are restrained um, on their knees, bent over the blood trough. One by one, they are bludgeoned, their throats are slit, and they are drained of blood. Bob, a black man in our group, resists this violence so vehemently that their captor, Gareth, removes his gag to hear him speak. He pleads for their lives, quote, there is a way out of all this. There's a way out. We can put the world back to the way it was, end quote. Gareth disagrees, and he laments we can't go back. Bob's plea for a return to normalcy ignores that this slaughter has always taken place, that violence against non-human animals always evokes other impressions, 
other oppressions, and that persons of color are also exploited and harmed by the animal industrial complex. However, the fact that a black man is most resistant to the ideologies and practices inherent to the slaughterhouse is powerful and significant due to the pre- and post-apocalyptic functions of the space. So Bob is conjuring and calling upon a past that never existed. Um, and we read this as a rhetorical technique to invoke an idealized whitewashed history that could appeal to Gareth. So essentially, Bob is erasing his own traumas in a moment of resistance to the slaughter and to the slaughterhouse itself. Our group eventually escapes, only to be followed um, by the Terminites, as they're called. Bob is recaptured and consumed alive. They cut off his leg and they eat it in front of him. Gareth says, quote, it's cosmic justice for it to be you, but we would have done it to anybody, end quote, conjuring the patriarchal and the racialized texts of meat. We do not believe it's a coincidence that the only one of our core group who is slaughtered is a black male. Bob's body as a racialized and animalized other is always tied to the prison and the slaughterhouse. Suddenly, Bob begins laughing hysterically and reveals that he was bitten by a zombie right before being captured. His deafening scream of tainted meat, tainted meat, can be read as a form of resistance. It is as if, it is as if he is saying, you will forever be defiled, polluted, and infected by the consumption of my flesh. In committing this violence against me, you have damned yourself. Michelle's perpetual movement and unrest is also a significant form of resistance for us. Whenever she is still, which is very seldom, she remembers past traumas and she mourns her losses, which makes her more vulnerable to her dangerous surroundings. She's continually moving about the world in a, in a world that has historically policed her movement as a black subject. The kinetic movement of black bodies is always an evasion of white because public space is red as white space. Think about the movement of Trayvon Martin in the suburban neighborhood, the movement of Michael Brown on the street, the movement of Eric Garner or C.C. McDonald on city sidewalks, the movement of Marlene Pinnock alongside the highway. All movement, the movement of black bodies must be arrested because it is trespassing on white property. In this apocalyptic world, Michelle's constant movement and errant survival through this movement is epic, undeniable resistance. In our material, re material realm, this kinetic movement of black bodies has resulted in the ideological movement of Black Lives Matter. This secondary movement is also an invasion of whiteness and an interruption of ideologies of white supremacy, which allow for the pervasiveness of white privilege and the genocide of black bodies. This ideological movement in turn sparks an abundance of physical movement by black bodies onto streets, onto sidewalks, blocking highways, forming barricades in front of government buildings, holding up signs and wearing controversial t-shirts and hoodies, further invading and trespassing upon white space and upon whiteness itself. It's a profound statement which spreads throughout the nation, across the globe, as well as in internet spaces. As we watch Michonne fluently wade through the unrelenting surge of zombies in The Walking Dead, and in reading the thoughts of white conservatives who refer to black protesters as animals and zombies, we return to this thought again and again. These two forms of black movement, kinetic and ideological, both inform one another in such significant ways and are also profoundly forms of resistance against oppressive and racist institutions. In this work, Michonne's perpetual movement in the world of the walking dead cannot be ignored, just as the revolutionary forms of movement by black bodies cannot be ignored in our reality. Considering this, we find ourselves asking, is a return to a pre-apocalyptic world something that Michonne would want? We, are, we would argue that Michonne immediately distrusts the welcoming community of Woodbury, um, not just because of his tyrannous governor, um, but because the idea of a return to normalcy doesn't necessarily mean a less violent life for her. In fact, it almost certainly promises the insidious violences of existing as a black female subject moving throughout a world deeply stratified by gender and race, which perpetually criminalizes her existence. This new world, while fraught with extraordinary dangers, is in many ways less violent towards persons of colors than the pre-apocalyptic reality, a harsh truth with which the Black Lives Matter movement continually reminds us of. People of color have always lived in a disjointed reality in which they have dis been disproportionately criminalized and targeted for by state violences. The zombie narrative has always functioned as a text which echoes the emotional climate of a culture. 
continually reaffirming the perceived value of whiteness, heteropatriarchy, and the nuclear family in the capitalist society. It is undeniably abject in that it continually disrupts borders of life and death, seeks to tear down the established order. Moreover, the zombie racial other is a monstrous manifestation of the fear of disadvantage, underrepresented, and oppressive bodies rising up to the dismantle systems of oppression. Considering the ongoing outcry against state violence by people of color in the Black Lives Matter movement, the fear of blackness and the denial of black life, which allow for the perpetual committing of state violences disproportionately against black bodies, and the ways in which the haunting imagery of these violences calls up the trauma of chattel slavery, we feel that this project is of a timely inception. Thank you. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.